Alrighty. <clears throat> yes, snowing over here. Um, pretty cold. Single digits, I imagine, with a strong wind. <laughs> Wonderful winter. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's begin. Oh, there was actually something I need to upload. One second, please. Um, just one second. All right. Okay, here we go. Um, <laughs> the sunshine. London. <laughs> That's not doesn't happen too often, I imagine. Huh? Well. Okay, so um, we are going to talk about today, uh, as the email I sent out, the. Um, title of the of today's class is listening and hearing but we're going to actually begin uh, in order to be able to understand this we have to begin with a verse uh, in uh, Exodus 18.1 which says as follows, uh, as follows I'll read the Hebrew translate Vayishma Yitro Kohen Midian Chuten Moshe and Jethro the High priest of Midian, I'll explain that in a minute, for the father in law of uh, Moses, of Moshe. He heard everything that Hashem had done to, that God had done to Moses and the Israelites, um, his people, that he taken them out of Egypt, etc., etc., etc. Okay. So, first of all, just to answer Annie's question, uh, Jethro, Yitro, was, that was his, uh, he was the high priest, that he was, in fact, the, um, the head, um, uh, I, I don't know, I suppose you could call it the Pope or whatever, I don't know what the, what the other equivalent is in his religion, what his religion was, but um, yeah, that's what he was, he was the high priest of Midian. And he had been become the high priest uh, by examining every religion that was around at that time until, but excluding Judaism at that, at that time. And he'd become an expert in all of them, and he was uh, therefore appointed the high priest of Midian. And then he got to study Judaism, and the story is told that he actually eventually converted. He converted. But anyway... Moses was married to his one of his daughters who had previously converted to Korah. So that's why he was Moshe's father-in-law. Okay. Now, so the word here, the word that's used here is, and Jethro heard. Right? He heard. Now, the word by Yishma, he heard. So Zohar asks a very interesting question. Only Jethro heard about this? The whole world heard about it. What do you mean only Jethro heard? So the Zohar goes on to explain that, that Jethro, Jethro heard it. Everybody else heard, Jethro listened. Yitro listened. In other words, he heard the internal message. Now, in order to be able to explain this, I first have to explain the concept of hearing as opposed to some of the other faculties. The main one I want to contrast it with is actually the faculty of hearing. Now, if you, um, um, I assume you can see the uh, Spira chart on the next page. Yes? Yeah, okay, good. So, I will explain, uh, maybe we'll explain at length, that seeing is a function of chokhmah. 
hearing is a function of Bina. Seeing is a function of Chokhmah, hearing is a function of Bina. Now, let, let's just understand, in order to be, able, to be able to understand what the difference is between Chokhmah and Bina, let's understand the difference between seeing and hearing. When a person hears something, let's say an explanation of something you're, you're hearing, what someone has to say. So hearing is essentially a linear exercise. Hearing is linear. Um, all right, let me just get my pad here, and we will work on this here. Linear. Yeah, so hearing is... Hearing is linear. What does it mean that hearing is linear? It means that you cannot hear everything at once. If a person is giving over a message and you said all the words at the same time, uh, you wouldn't be able to hear anything. You have to distinguish one thing from another and sort of, so to speak, connect the dots when the person is speaking also. He speaks in this way that there's a dot, there's one, he makes one point, then another point, and then another point, and another point, another point with another word or whatever, and they're all connected into a single idea, right? That's the idea of linear hearing. We hear things in a linear way. And then we interpret them in a linear way. Well, that's the function of Bina. Bina works in a linear fashion. It works by consecutively adding information one bit at a time. It what we would be called, I guess, serial. Linear or serial, right? In a series, in other words, right? If anyone's involved with computer, I guess you know what serial as opposed to linear is. Right? Whereas Chokhmah does not work in that way. Chokhmah, see, Chokhmah is vision, sight. When one sees something, generally you don't see things one little bit at a time. You see the entire picture. When someone's describing the picture, to you have to describe it one word, one concept, one idea at a time, and then build up a composite picture in a serial or a linear way. Whereas vision seeing is not done in a linear way. It's done in a, um, what would be the opposite of linear? Um, I know in computers, uh, yeah, it's kind of multi. In a, yeah. There must be another word uh, for it, no? Sort of in a composite way. Everything all at, um, everything all at once in an encompassing way. I don't, know, I don't know what the word is. I can't... Uh, Holistic, yeah, maybe holistic would work, yeah. Right. Well, holistic has certain connotations that um, um, certain connotations that um, may not be correct as far as Hochman is concerned. But anyway, let's go with holistic, yeah. It sees things as the whole picture, right? Seeing is the entire picture. Uh, the entirety, let's call it, right? See, the, see is the entirety all at once. Right, there we go. You see the entirety all at once, the entirety of the thing all at once. Okay. That's how seeing works. Now, um, I might have mentioned this before, once before, but, um, it was a very interesting um, course that I once start, started and didn't finish. <laughs> um, it was a speed reading course. I speed read anyway almost naturally, but um, um, there was a speed reading course that I once uh, listened to. Um, and the person who was teaching the course had actually uh, he speed read the entire encyclopedia. Encyclopedia Britannica, <laughs> and still recalled most of it, um, like well over 80% of it, so you can imagine. In any event, 
yeah, maybe gestalt would be the right word. I don't know. It's called more experience, I think. But in any event, the um, uh, the trick he said to speed reading is not to read things the way you hear them. The way you hear it is linear. The way you see things is you really see the whole page at a time. It's not the way you've been taught to read. You've been taught to read one letter, one word at a time, right? And then uh, one sentence and so on and so forth. You go in a linear fashion. But really, if you're using your eyes, you should really look at things in the way that sight works, not in the way that hearing works. You should really be looking at things in terms of um, the, the entire page. That's how you should read. Left brain is linear, right brain is gestalt. Ah, okay, fine. It's good. Okay, got it. Very nice. Um, okay, good. So, the, uh, so, therefore, speed reading, in order to speed read, you're taking the whole page at once and let your subconscious mind do the processing. That's what he, uh, that's what he was teaching at the time. Now, um, it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting concept. Therefore, in order to be able to, uh, to, to, to hear something, we have to, in a sense, involve the power of sight as well. One of the, one of the qualities of vision is taking in the whole picture in order to be able to hear really well and hear, uh, hear, hear completely we have to um, amalgamate these two qualities. That's anyway according to the speed reader. And that is very much the case in Kabbalah it says about Chochmah and Bina, Chochmah and Bina are called the two friends or the two lovers sometimes who are never parted. You can translate it one way or the other. Train rain, the Lomis Parshman Omi. The two beloveds who never part ever. In other words, both of them work, they work together in a sort of a symbiotic uh, sense. One helps the other. So, when Jethro was hearing, what kind of hearing was he doing? Was he doing linear hearing or was he doing all-encompassing hearing? Was he seeing the entirety of the picture? Was he doing gestalt, as Terry calls it, gestalt listening? Actually, according to the books, he was doing more than that. He was doing more than both of those. There is a statement of the sages that says, like this. Um, let me just... Okay. There's a... Um, a rabbinic statement called a Mishnah in Pirka Avot, the third chapter, Ethics of the Father. It's really a book of ethics mostly, but um, it's got a lot of wisdom writing in it as well. It's written by the sages in the early, um, the early sages called the, the authors of the Mishnah. So it says like this, Yes, um, bigger, it's a bit better. Okay, so what does this say? This says that the fence around Chokhmah is silence. Now, when a person is talking, obviously they can't be silent same time. They can't listen. You can't listen and talk. That's one of the disadvantages. It's one of the disadvantages of um, uh, one of the disadvantages of, 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 of listening. Yeah, you can't listen and talk at the same time. Um, 
I'm sure that many people in um, synagogues will tell you, um, you know, the ones who talk during the rabbi's sermon, oh yeah, we were listening, yeah, sure. And, <laughs> okay, so in any event, um, the, uh, the, the boundary around or the fence around wisdom is silence. So this is explained in Kabbalistic writings, meaning to say, if we would, if we would draw three sort of parallel pictures, right? If we would draw three, uh, not parallel, if we did three uh, inter, how do you call it? Like the skins of an onion. What are they called? The uh, three uh, interlaced pictures, not interlaced. I don't know what the word is. Anyway, whatever, right? So here in the center we have hearing, concentric. That's what I'm looking for, right? Hearing. Here we have seeing, the seeing encompasses hearing, as you said, it's, right? Uh, even more than that, uh, more than interlocking, it would be concentric, yeah? And here would be silence. Right, silence. Oops, it's supposed to be an S. That is supposed to be an S, but it didn't really get to look like one. <laughs> Forget it. All right, you understand silence, right? Okay. Uh, so we have silence, we have sight, and we have hearing. Now, sight, to a certain extent, is a um, a higher mode of hearing, because hearing is only linear, and sight takes in the whole picture all at once, it's a gestalt. And silence takes in both of them at the same time. In Kabbalistic terms, silence refers to Keter. Right? Siyagla Chochmah, the fence around Chochmah, is Keter. Shtika, silence. Now, when we talk about silence, we're not talking about silence, no response. We're talking about active silence. Active silence is not just hearing, but listening. And not just listening in a linear fashion, not even listening in a composite um, um, in, in, in a composite entirety fashion, but Listening here, listening means this concept of keter. This act of listening is hearing what's behind the words, hearing the the the, uh, the unspoken behind the words that are spoken. As we all know, yeah, listening to the silence exactly. As we all know. Um, words cannot always express everything. When a person is, for instance, in a tremendously, uh, a tremendous emotional upheaval, he might not be able to speak at all. He can't get the words out. In such cases, the person may merely cry or moan because of the the, 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 the pain or whatever the experience is so vast that it cannot yet be put into words. Words require some distance because words are ultimately called a garment. Words are only, uh, and, and thoughts are also a garment. Thought, speech, and action are, sort of, so to speak, the garments for deeper things. So, when a person is trying to, um, when, when he's going through an emotional upheaval, or even an intellectual upheaval, it's hard to find the words or the thoughts to express that emotion or that intellectual idea initially. It demands some distance from it in order to be able to put it into words, in order to be able to put it into um, the words of thought patterns of thought, so to speak, right? That's called the function of Keter. Now, in Kabbalah, this is also referred to as, this concept is referred to as 
um, the idea of what is called Hashmal. Now, Hashmal in modern Hebrew means electricity, if I'm not mistaken. In, um, in, in Hebrew, the word Hashmal, um, Hashmal means a sort of a revelation of light, a glow. Hashmal, yeah. Uh, S H C A C H A S H M A L. Hashmal. So, when Ezekiel saw the, uh, the vision of the chariot, so he said he saw, part of, the, part of the vision was that he saw the Hashmal. What is the Hashmal? So, it's explained in Kabbalah, the Hashmal, it's like this electric glow, which is why they call it in modern Hebrew uh, electricity uh, uh, Hashmal. But it, 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 Kabbalah explains it's really comprised of two words. Hash, which means silent, and Mal, which means speaking. So there's sometimes silence, and sometimes they're speaking. But sometimes there is the silence which speaks when it's a whole word together. As I'll say, I'll say just say that itim hashois, itim mamalores. Sometimes they're silent, and sometimes there's sometimes there's silence, sometimes there is speaking. In other words, sometimes there's communication from above, and sometimes there's not communication. Hash and mal. Sometimes there's silence, sometimes there's communication. We'll speak about why the communication sometimes has to be in a mode of silence. But sometimes, at other times, if you take it as a whole word, if you take the whole word, hashmal, that means a silent speaking, or a speaking silence. Now there is a, <laughs> there's an interesting story one of the, there was a Hasidic Rebbe whose name was, a uh, Hasidic rabbi whose name was um, Yitzhak Mivorki, from a place called Vorki, I think in Poland, who had some very unusual uh, customs, but one of his customs was that um, when he had private audience with people, he would not speak at all. He would just remain silent. He wouldn't give them why. Um, he wanted them to hear the silence. He wanted them to be able to come to the answer from within. So one of the secrets of, um, of, of true hearing is to find the answer within. To find the speech within. In other words, when there's silence, I can hear what's going on internally within me. So silence is a very, uh, a very important, uh, a very important method. That silence, uh, in many ways, speaks volume. Speaks volume. Uh, again, that story of Rabbi Yitzhak Avorki. So um, um, another great sage came to visit him, and they went into his study, and both of them sat in silence, but. Um, as the expression goes, they were both sweating bullets. <laughs> and afterwards, afterwards, the visitor came out and he said, um, he questioned me to my core. He, he, uh, you know, he analyzed me, he analyzed me to my very core. But every time, I had an answer for him. Right? I had a, I had a, I had a response. My, my response was. Uh, uh, was a full answer to his question. Now, they both remained silent for a period of about an hour. Right? So, where was the questioning, where was the asking, and where was the answering? Uh, there wasn't. There was silence, and there was silence. There was silence, which is, um, there was silence which was speaking, and there was speaking which was silent. There was hash and mal. There was silence which was speaking, and there was speaking which was silent. And that's what was going on. Now, let's take it a step deeper. The word hash um, that we mentioned before, this word over here, this word hash, or 
Fernsehen in indischen Zeitung des Hash. It's related to the word Hashai, silent, and various other, uh, or secret, to do things in secret. Um, this word also means another thing. It's related to Hash. Is Hash is related to the word Hush. Hash is related to the word Hush. Which means a sense, one of the senses. So this hash over here, hash really means to be able to sense things in a much deeper way. Not necessarily hear them with your cerebral cortex, but to be able to sense them on a deeper level. Perhaps on a transcendent level, that's why it's associated with Keter. It's whole experience, the experience of the wholeness of something. I suppose again Terry would say more the gestalt of the thing. It's hearing things in a in a comp in a complete way. It's hearing the inner dimensions of the thing rather than simply the spoken word. It's hearing the words behind the spoken words. It's hearing the non words behind the spoken words. It's hearing the feelings behind the words. It's hearing beyond the feelings behind the words. It's hearing the person himself. Now let's go back to our verse for a minute. And Jethro, Yitro, the high priest of Midian, Moshe's father-in-law, heard what God had done for or to Moshe and the Israelites. What Jethro heard was he heard his son-in-law. He heard what God had done for Moshe to Moshe. In other words, he heard what Moses was all about. Jethro was a leader. He was a high priest in his place. And Moses, even though he wasn't a high priest, but he was um, that Aaron became the high priest. But at that time he was the leader of his people. Jethro was the leader of his, of Midian. He was the spiritual leader. And Moses, Moshe, was the spiritual leader of the Jewish people. What Jethro heard behind the words that God communicated to Moses, to Moshe, Jethro heard that transformation that had taken place in Moses, Moshe, and the Israelites. In other words, he heard the whole person. He didn't just hear the words, but he heard the whole thing. Now, to go back to our question from the Zohar. It says, and Jethro heard. The Zohar asked the question, but didn't the whole world hear? Everybody heard. Everybody heard about the giving of the Torah. Everybody heard about the exodus, the exodus of the Jews from Egypt. Everybody heard about these things. Why does it say only that Jethro heard? For Jethro, after he experienced, in other words, he heard what was behind the words, he heard what was behind God's communication to Moshe, he heard about the transformation that had taken place. He extracted what he needed for himself. There's hearing, and this what's called in Yiddish, to heren or to der heren. There's to hear and there's to um, der her, to hear through and through. In other words, to hear from the message what is relevant to you and to act upon it. There's to hear and there's to be permeated by the sound of something that is relevant to you. That, perme that, 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 that permeating sound that permeates into the very person himself, that changes the inner uh, being of the person. 
when the Jewish people heard the words of the Torah being given, when they heard the messages from God, they became transformed. When Moshe heard the words from God, he became transformed. That's why his face was shining, and we'll find out in another couple of uh, Torah readings uh, later on, he had to cover his face. His face was shining so brightly that he had to cover it. Why? Because he dare heard, he heard inwardly. That inward hearing means he extracted everything that was relevant to him and transformed him. So Jesus' hearing meant he also understood from this that if you hear things in a deep way, you have to change as well. Yes, Jesus' hearing meant that he had to change. Not simply a segula. It wasn't just a segula in the sense that um, um, it sort of helped him along. It was a transformational hearing. It was a hearing of the silence behind the words. It was a hearing, uh, let's use the term in the English term, it was a pregnant silence, right? But, but pregnant silence doesn't yet give birth, right? What he heard was the silence giving birth. Giving birth to what? Giving birth to a new Israel, to a new Jethro. That's what he heard. He heard in the message what was relevant to him. And that what, what was relevant to him, the word, the, the, the words behind the word, the message behind the words, was a transformational message. When he heard that, then he said, uh, I've, I've heard everything that there was to hear about godliness in the sense of this kind of hearing. You know, we could uh, really... Um, uh, turn this picture on its, um, this diagram on its head, and we could put the silence really at the core in many ways, right? That would be the silence, and then around it would be the seeing, and then around that would be the hearing. In other words, it's getting to the very core of everything. In any event, it doesn't matter which way we look at it. But the point is that when, that, 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 that Yitro, after he heard, what did he say? He came along and he said that um, something has to something has to change in me, and that's exactly uh, that's exactly what happened. He came. He then came, and um, from from his place where he was living in Midian, and he came and he said. I am coming to you. I'm coming to. I'm coming to uh, Moshe. I'm coming to you now. And um, what happens immediately was that Moshe brings him in. What does it mean? He brings him in. He brings. It says that he brought him into uh, into. The, he brought him into the tent. What tent did he bring him into? Well, simply, he brought him into the tent of um, into his tent. But that's not what the way the sages understand the verse. They brought him into the tent, which was the uh, tabernacle. He brought him into the tabernacle. He brought him into, in other words, he brought him into the divine communication. That's what he brought him into. Once Jethro had heard, once Israel had heard the inner message, now it was time to bring him into the edifice of communication. And uh, that's why he brought him into, so to speak, he brought him into the tent, into the tent of um, uh, where the Shekhinah dwelled, where the divine presence was dwelling. And that was transformational completely for Yitro. Um, okay, any questions? Okay, so basically then the message is um, um, listening, not hearing. Hearing is, uh, you know, um, goes in one ear and out of the other basically. 
listening is listening for the message behind the words, and then deep listening is the ability to extract, first of all, the ability to, to, to hear the whole picture, and then the ability to extract from that picture what is relevant to my uh, inner self-transformation. Once you have the silence, is that then revelation? Uh, it could be, it could be, um, yeah, Moses' purpose in bringing Israel into the center of Israel, yeah, 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 yeah. Once you have the silence, then the, the, is that then revelation? That silence can be revelation, or really it is, it's the, it's the, um, how should I say, the doorstep of revelation, the door frame, it's the frame. In that silence is then the message that's there for you. That internal message, which if the person manages to extract that internal message for him, then, um, then, that's, then that's revelation. So, revelation is for the listener only. Let me, let me take it a step further. I'm not sure if I get exactly get what your question is, but I think what you meant was this. Everyone can hear the same words, but each of us extracts the message that's relevant to us as individuals. The counseling. Sorry, I'll just turn that off. Um, yeah, in counseling, I would say that that's, uh, that's really what it is, especially when there's group counseling or whatever, so you might be speaking to a number of different people, but what you want is for the person to be able to extract the message from what's in himself, from the silence, in other words, from what's around the words, from what's behind the words, etc., to be able to extract what is relevant uh, to the person himself. And many people from the same message can extract all kinds of different, from the same words can extract many different messages. So Terry says, maybe I can say a little bit of aura, or like uh, immense glowing, uh, glowing pictures. Uh, yes, it is. But, but when, then you have to ask yourself, uh, Terry, in, in that picture, in that sort of glowing picture, what, um, what, what particular thing do I uh, extract from that message? In other words, if it's just uh, an, a, a, an intellectual exercise, I see a bigger picture of things. I see the, uh, the the larger, I see the larger picture. I see the framework. Well, that's that's that, that's that's a um, that's a sight kind of a uh, thing. Yeah, I'm seeing the bigger picture. But the bigger picture is not really all that there is to it. There's hearing, in, you know, just hearing the words, right? And in the hearing there's listening. And then there's the sight, in other words, being able to see the bigger picture, to see the thing as a whole, right? And then in the silence is, as Annie says, the framework for the transformation. What's in the silence is the message to me. What's in the silence is the transformation. And that transformation cannot be expressed initially. Um, it requires siyag l'choch um, mashtika, the fence around, or the crown. The crown of wisdom is silence. That's a lot, lot, yes. Okay. It takes time to absorb. Again, absorbing something is in silence generally and not so much in speech. The absorption is in silence rather than in speech. The hush rather than the mouth. Silence rather than the, uh, the communication. But because that silence is that silence 
is in a sense like willingness to open up, to become um, receptive to a deeper message from above. God. <laughs> Good one, Annie. <laughs> All right. Um, good. All right. So that's about it. Unless anyone has any more questions. Unless uh, questions, observations. Yeah. All righty. Welcome. Okay. Okay, folks, so we'll call it a day. It doesn't look like there are any more questions. Um, maybe. No. Really spoke to you. Oh. <laughs> okay. Fine and sweet. Very nice and hot. Yeah, have a wonderful day, everybody. Keep warm. For those of you who are... Uh, in the uh, colder climates. More uh, recordings. Uh, yep. Alrighty. Okay, folks. Call it a day then. Have a good one.